and um, and we can go from there. So Susan, I think you have the ball. So if you want to uh, start your presentation, that would be great. Very good. Thank you so much, Catherine. I'm just delighted to uh, partner with you um, today, and thank you for the opportunity to share some ideas and thoughts with regard to this topic. And thanks to all of you who are joining us and sharing your lunch hour with us today. Um, we really appreciate it. So with that, we'll just go ahead and, and get into it. What I've outlined here are a couple of learning objectives. Really, my intention for our session here today is to do two things. So one is to share some ideas and thoughts with you so that you can more effectively articulate the business case for connecting sustainability to HR processes. And you know, HR and sustainability are not necessarily two terms that people often associate with one another. And so my, my goal is to give you, um, you know, some data points and some information so that you can help people sort of make those connections. And so we'll spend some time initially talking about that business case. And then the second objective is to really hopefully uh, give you enough information today so that you can identify one to two actionable opportunities where you can partner with your local HR leadership. Um, if you're not in a sort of a, a, an organization that, that has um, a, a formal HR function, then you know I would encourage you to seek out uh, colleagues, other individuals that you know that, that have a sort of an HR background and, and ideally um, you know, share some of these ideas and thoughts. But, but um, hopefully the information that you will receive will uh, have you feel empowered to be able to identify those opportunities. So those are really the two um, objectives for today. In terms of the agenda, how we'll get there, we'll spend a few minutes initially talking about why align HR and sustainability. Again, there, there are two areas that don't necessarily naturally fit together in most people's minds, but I would argue there are quite a few good points of connection, and, and so we'll talk about, again, that business case. Second is we'll uh, spend probably about 20 or 25 minutes, and I have just sort of said here, reimagining HR. So I'll ask you to think about We'll cover some information, taking a sort of a traditional look at HR processes, and then how those processes could be reimagined a bit and, and looked at through a sustainability lens. And then the last part, as I mentioned, is, is sort of the action planning and, and giving you a, a few moments to think about how you would uh, take some action with this information. With that, we'll go ahead and um, jump into things. And, you know, before, um, before I get into the content, I, I thought it might be worth sharing a, a few thoughts and ideas with you with regard to my own sustainability story. So um, I would say, you know, for me, my story started back in 1991. I, um, as Catherine had mentioned, have a bachelor's in psychology, and I went to school at a small liberal arts school in southern Indiana here in the States um, called the University of Evansville. One of the reasons I was drawn to the University of Evansville is that they have a terrific um, study abroad program, and so I had an opportunity to spend a semester in Grantham, England, which is about an hour and a half north of London. And while I was there, I had the chance to um, study and learn uh, and do a project actually related to um, the body shop, where I um, had a chance to sort of learn about the, the history of the body shop and, and sort of how they were uh, creating, honestly, that sort of sustainable enterprise before that language uh, was familiar uh, to us and, and even created. So um, that, I would say, you know, sort of created um, a spark, an interest in me. And, uh, and so I've always sort of had that, had that interest. I was fortunate, as Catherine um, has also mentioned, to have spent a good deal of my career at Baxter Healthcare and Baxter has that long um, time commitment to uh, sustainability and um, environmental stewardship and so on. So if you flash forward from 91 to about 18 years later, and I, and I know the particular date, <laughs> it's July 7th of 2009, um, you know, I live in the western suburbs of Chicago, and for many years when I worked for Baxter, I had a pretty lengthy commute, and so often I would 
uh, listen to an interview program in the morning by a well-known interviewer, Bob Edwards. And on this particular date, he was talking with an author um, named James Lovelock. And you see the book there that he was talking about, The Vanishing Face of Gaia. And as I tell people, you know, I, I don't know if it was just hearing the information that he was sharing on that particular day and or the fact that I was a relatively new mom at the time. Um, I have uh, twin girls. Um, but there was something about that, um, that information and how it was presented in, in that point in time uh, that not only piqued my interest, but sort of sent me on a quest of sorts. And so, you know, really from that date forward, I've been, um, you know, very focused in trying to figure out how can I take my background, which is primarily in, in HR, uh, business partner types of roles, and uh, later in my career in more talent management um, types of roles, how can I take that and, and uh, make a contribution to this sustainability space? And so it's, it's really that um, aspect of connecting HR and sustainability that I was very focused on. Um, and then the two driving forces for me are really my two daughters. Uh, my daughters are now um, six, they're twins, and uh, keep us uh, moving at a, a fast pace, but I think serve as a daily reminder for how quickly, um, you know, life is moving, but then also, you know, gives me a sense of urgency to try to do as much as I can um, with the background that I have and apply that to this sustainability space. So. I, I at least wanted to share that story with you because I do often get questions of, well, gosh, why is an HR person sort of interested in this in this topic area? But in a nutshell, you know, that's sort of my story. So, you know, to get things started here, we'd like to ask a question, or I'd like to ask a question. And if you can just chat, um, you know, chat into the, the box there, um, we'd like to get a sense for how aligned are your organization's sustainability strategies and your HR processes today. So, um, you know, you can just sort of say they're strongly aligned, somewhat aligned, somewhat misaligned, maybe strongly misaligned, uh, or maybe you're not sure uh, where things stand, and, and that's okay as well. But if you can go ahead and, and chat in and uh, we'll get a sense for how you sort of see that alignment today. Yeah, uh, I, would, I would ask people to use the chat if they would. I know some of you may not, um, well, I don't know if you have access to it, but uh, I would really love to, to see us uh, kind of participate in this way. Um, I don't know, do you have a moment? Do you want to ask somebody? I know that Rebecca uh, and Lisa, uh, so Rebecca is with, with the city of Huntstown in Huntsville, and Lisa, her HR manager, are actually sitting in the room together. And I don't know, Rebecca, um, would you be willing, uh, and Lisa, to, to talk about how you guys feel your alignment is right now? I know I'm putting you on the spot. I apologize for that. That's why we're Guys. taking it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, well, and, and that's, a, that's an honest answer. I mean, it's just you're trying to figure out how the two fit together. Uh, I'll just let you talk, the two of you talk for a second. So I think that we can, oh, can we? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, you are unmuted right now, so you can talk. We can hear you. Okay, good. I can? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's Lisa here. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, my goodness. Um, what we, we've been, I mean, we've I've done a lot of talking about how to, um, how Rebecca put it, kind of embed sustainability um, with um, human resources. We've had some really good discussions. Um, one of the reasons why I'm here um, is to find out strategies on how to do that. One thing that we have done is we've uh, included um, a sustainability um, component into all of our job descriptions um, for the town of Huntsville, um, which is a start for us um, that provides some uh, description for each job as to how they are responsible for sustainability. And the other thing that we've done, um, we try to do, or Lisa tries to do, and I, I help sometimes is um, when we interview candidates at the later stages of 
the interview process once we've narrowed once the HR has narrowed down the candidates, they um, will ask each of them a question of, you know, it doesn't know, always uh, relate to the specific skills of the job that they're applying for, but relates to sustainability and reviews and kind of making sure that they're, you know, if they don't know what it is, that they Right. I think we only cut the realize it's important to us and that they um, have the right attitude and incorporated. Okay. Well, unfortunately, we're only catching a bit of that, Rebecca. We heard Lisa very well, but um, but it sounds like you're you're doing a check after um, after you've narrowed down the candidates to find alignment with. Is it the values that that uh, you'd be looking for um, within that individual and their their linkage to sustainability? That's what it sounds like. Exactly. Yeah. One other thing too is um, Rebecca uh, spends quite a bit of time um, engaging our staff uh, with respect to sustainability, and it can be in things like we have contests, um, and we have um, certain things that um, Rebecca has done, like uh, the worm um, composting um, that w that she has staff involved in in particular projects. Um, and we also try to include staff to, from a staff perspective into any kind of tactical teams that we have with respect to sustainability. Okay, great, good. All right, so I'm going to uh, pass this back on to uh, uh, Susan, but uh, in the meantime, if you'd be kind enough to put into the chat how, what kind of uh, alignment you think you have. I'm seeing a few people putting that information in privately, so it's helping me, but it's not helping anybody else. So if you um, do feel comfortable saying what kind of alignment you feel you have, try to send it to everyone so that they can see. But um, I'm, Susan, I'm seeing a couple of people saying there's minimal alignment. Um, you know, I hear with Rebecca and Lisa talking about, yeah, they're, they're trying to figure it out and that's fantastic. Um, and uh, uh, another person is saying sustainability is a company value. HR uses this to attract candidates, but there doesn't seem to be any formal alignment to the processes right now. So I'll, I'll pass that back to you, Susan. Very good. Thank you, um, Lisa and Rebecca, and, and thanks to all of you for um, for sharing those ideas. And I guess I would say in my own experience, you know, based on everything that I've, I've read and learned over the last five years, talking with many, many individuals anecdotally, I think what you're reflecting um, back to us is is sort of the state of where things are at right now. Um, I think most organizations are, are just starting to you know, look at ways to create that alignment or just starting to think about these topics. So thanks, thanks for sharing all of those thoughts and ideas. And you know, ultimately, uh, a lot of this is, is about culture. So you know, when you think about an organization's culture, and that includes all of the aspects you know, that you see on this slide and, and probably more, creating a culture where individuals and teams and organizations can meaningfully integrate sustainability into their day-to-day -day work is, is sort of what we're talking about here. But it's much easier said, you know, than done. Um, culture uh, includes, again, some of these aspects. It includes the financial aspects, thinking about innovation, process improvement, uh, employee engagement, as Lisa and Rebecca have shared, in addition to things that we traditionally associate with sustainability efforts, like environmental stewardship and looking at energy costs and things like that. You know, I really think that one of the keys to success is making sure that there's something for everyone. Somebody that I worked with uh, for a number of years at Baxter, uh, who is in a sustainability role, so she's sort of one of those individuals who has sustainability in her job title, if you will. Uh, she described to me a few years ago sort of an idea of how, how she thinks about sustainability as it relates to engagement, let's say. Um, you know, she said she sort of sees it as a menu, right, and, and a menu on which uh, there are many different selections and many ways that people can uh, connect to sustainability and take part uh, if they choose to in, um, in supporting the organization's sustainability goals and priorities. And really, HR has a huge role to play in that, as HR is traditionally seen as a cultural steward in many organizations. So 
So I think that idea of culture and having that sort of, you know, as a, a foundational part of, of your thinking on this uh, would be helpful. The other thing that, um, you know, Catherine mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, I have spent some time, uh, actually a fairly considerable amount of time this year with a, a book, uh, and you see, um, uh, you know, a, 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 a tribute, um, the, the name of the book here at the bottom, so Talent Transformation in the Triple Bottom Line uh, by Andrew Savitz with Carl Weber. And I think this is a really important um, concept. Actually, if you walked away with just this concept from our time together today, you'd, you'd probably be ahead of the pack, if you will, uh, as it relates to sustainability and HR and engagement and, and connecting some of these pieces. Um, the idea here is that there's really an interrelationship of sustainability, employee engagement, and business results. So a positive relationship along any leg that you see on this triangle reinforces the positive relationships along the other two. So sustainability programs often provide direct benefits to a business, and, and you see those. It's a little bit small, but you can sort of see those uh, stemming off of, off of this model. And these efforts engage those who uh, participate as well as those who simply know about the program. So what's interesting about sustainability programs is, uh, as Rebecca and Lisa shared, you know, a lot of companies and organizations are developing programs and ways to engage employees. But, uh, you know, there, there is um, some research that's been done that's found that even individuals who are part of those organizations who are not actively participating, maybe in all of those initiatives, uh, their engagement also goes up. So it, it's actually sort of amazing and, and good news because it says that, you know, any efforts that you've got underway, even if you've got a small population, at least initially, that's engaging in those efforts, you know, there can be benefits to that broader organization. And as engagement increases, the business may see increased benefits, so things like improved productivity, reduced turnover, absenteeism um, being lowered, all those types of things. And in some cases, the engagement benefits may actually outweigh the more traditional benefits, like savings from energy use and things like that. Um, you know, I, I know that there was some research done a number of years ago that found a very similar um, result when they looked at green buildings, for example. So green buildings often people are attracted to because of the energy savings. Um, I believe it was a study out of Stanford, and what they found was that the benefits from an engagement perspective and a health and wellness perspective actually outweighed, you know, the benefits from, from just the pure energy savings. So, you know, I think this is a really, again, if you take away one concept from our time today, I think this would be a, a great concept for you to, to think about and, and potentially share with others. And so, you know, that sort of brings us to the how, right? So, so if this all sounds pretty good and if you're sort of nodding and saying, yeah, that makes sense to me, um, you know, that, that sort of gets to, well, you know, how do, how do we do that? How do we get started with that? And this next uh, slide, slide eight, is designed to say there, the way that, that you really uh, start to do this is by drawing connections. So, you know, many uh, individuals may recognize Andrew Savitz, his name, not so much maybe because of the, the recent book, but he did uh, a book that's, you know, very well known called The Triple Bottom Line, right? And, and so that triple bottom line concept is one that he brought over into talent, transformation in the triple bottom line. And the general idea is what you see here, that um, from a strategy perspective, and I would say even in terms of policies and programs and so on, what you want to try to do is to find those points of intersection. So looking at business strategy and sustainability strategy and your people and HR strategies and figuring out where are the points where those align and you can, um, you can really uh, zero in on those. And, you know, Catherine and I were chatting for a, a few moments uh, before the call and I, I shared with her um, a program that I recently did with the Net Impact a Chicago group. It was on um, bringing a sustainability lens to any role. And I mention it because we sort of talked about this idea of concentric circles. And someone in the program, uh, one of the participants said, well, you know, I think concentric circles are good 
But I think another um, way to think about those circles is almost like a nesting circle. So if you think about three circles, not, not just um, with a narrow point of intersection, but three circles sort of laid on top of each other, um, you know, there, there are probably a lot more points of intersection uh, than, than we might realize or, or always be, be thinking about. And I think the nature of a concentric circle diagram like this one suggests there's really, you know, narrow points of intersection. And she said, you know, I, I, think, I think when you think about it differently, when you think about that nesting idea, um, and so it's really an expansion of this idea, um, there might be, again, more points of intersection than you might realize. And I, I, I like this quote from the book. So Savit says, you know, developing business strategy without having sustainability and HR leaders involved is going to feel increasingly like trying to develop strategy without having finance leaders present, which no organization, you know, would do. So again, it's just sort of a new, a new way of, of looking at some of these, um, these processes. Okay. And that sort of brings us to the, the second question that we wanted to ask. Um, and, and again, we'll just sort of leave it open. You know, we have a few areas that we'll be focusing on during our time today, but uh, we'd love to get your uh, thoughts and feedback. Which area do you see the greatest opportunity from, from the chair that you sit in to reimagine your organization's HR processes using a sustainability lens? Go ahead and um, take a pause there, and Catherine, any you want to add? Sure, yeah, please um, again put it into your chat. If there's, uh, if there's any of you that um, have a little bit of experience in this area and see where that, that um, connection seems to be working for you, uh, I know, um, I think it was uh, uh, Esther was saying that she's um, been following, you know, she read the Savix book and also has been following Elaine uh, Cohn, Cohn as well. And um, I'd be interested, um, Esther, and I don't know if you can talk, but if you can, um, what, what are some of the areas that you've been maybe um, focusing on in this particular area? Because it sounds like it's an area that you've really been reading up on and, and looking for those connections. Uh, I've unmuted you if you can talk, that would be great. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, thank you. Oh. Great. <laughs> okay. I press the. I click the uh, the mic button. So I guess uh, that's the best way to do it. Can can yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm um, I'm a sustainability um, uh, um, consultant with a background in HR. So I've been looking at that area for for uh, several years and and being and not being very successful at it. I have to admit because I have most HR people managers I meet do not see or are only starting to see the link and it's um so it, it's hard to to answer the, the the question i see many many different areas where uh hr and sustainability i mean hr can can support and and change the culture in terms of sustainability first of all um involving hr into sustainability strategy is i don't know if that's the kind of answer you're you're looking for you tell me um, while i speak um, but involving, we insist, uh, we always insist to have the HR person around the table, which is not a natural um, a reflex for, for sustainability um, managers, actually. They usually think you need to have the operational and, and environmental people and maybe strategy, but they, it's, it's, they seldom think of HR as a partner in that, which I think is a mentality uh, which we need to, uh, to um, make evolve as well. I think HR people need to insist that their their presence is is uh, relevant and useful and uh, i think in terms of um, creating opportunities for people to um, participate to solutions i think creating environments where um, um, creativity is is uh, possible um, creating focus groups or open innovation process uh, opportunities is that the kind of answer you're looking for yeah, exactly. I mean, I love that that uh, idea. You know, just simply making sure they're at the table. It makes um, so much sense. It really does. It and that sense. idea. Yeah. Yeah. Also, be, because um, because first of all, they don't realize HR managers don't realize how much uh, value added they bring to sustainability because they most of them don't even see the link. 
So when there and and I've seen transformations into HR professionals when they're because they're sitting at the table and they fully understand how much they're contributing already and how much more they can contribute and how much uh, necessary they are in the pro transformation process. So once they understand that because they're at the table, then it's much easier. Um, and I think there's obviously, you know, training um, to promote, uh, also including that and in, including um, in sustainability related competencies or, or in the job descriptions, in the uh, recruitment uh, ads, as, as uh, somebody mentioned before. And also, one thing that I have not seen yet much is um, including uh, adding some uh, personal and team objectives for the, uh, you know, mm -hmm. your yearly objectives. I've seen a lot of, uh, I, I can think of one of my clients who, um, who, uh, and they say they, they, it doesn't go further than planification and, and uh, they, HR, it, it, it doesn't work. I mean, the implementation doesn't work in the company of the sustainability strategy, even though it's very ambitious and very relevant. Uh, but uh, but they don't have any objectives. You know, department the the um, uh, purchasing department doesn't have an, an objective, a team objective to start a, sustain, a sustainable purchasing um, uh, framework or approach. So why would they do it? Even you know, even though they're very interested. So I think that yeah. HR has to put that on the table um, as soon as possible. Otherwise, it's going to be hard to change. I think those are great comments. Thank you so much. Um, and yeah. as as you're going forward, Susan, I'd love to have you also maybe address this question that Esther has brought forward about bringing people to the table, but how do you convince that HR person who's very, very busy that it's a highly relevant thing so that they will actually spend their time there? I think once they get there, they're probably, um, it's easier for them to become engaged in it, but getting them there might be a, a challenge. And just before I hand it back to you, Susan, I, I see that um, uh, other folks are, are commenting around, you know, moving away from performance appraisals to performance management systems. Um, Pat uh, is talking about to recruit, recruiting competencies, learning and goal setting, which I think we heard Esther talk about as well. And um, Rebecca saying the big opportunity for them is in the hiring process. So make sure that they're creating that culture of the attitude um, and values associated with it. Um, and, uh, and Mary's saying, I'm finding that part of being open to sustainability relates to the, candid the candidate's generation. So that's interesting too, you know, is this um, generation, and, and Susan, you can speak to this generation Y thing as well. Yeah. Yeah, thank you again for all of your um, comments and feedback and Esther, for sort of um, your feedback and, and observations, so we can all hear those. You know, these are all great. Um, these are all great comments and, and questions. And you know, I, let me. I mean, we'll we'll start to move through, and then as you've suggested, Catherine, I'll I'll include my my comments as we start to move through some of this content. But as it relates to the generational piece, there has been some really interesting data research done, I'm, I'm sure you've seen different uh, pieces of, of research related to that topic. As Catherine had mentioned early on the call, I am very involved in net impact, which may be familiar to some of you, but maybe not all of you. If you just Google um, net impact, and you can certainly take a look even as we're chatting today, uh, net impact has been uh, a real thought leader partnered with Rutgers to um, put together, I believe it was Rutgers, uh, maybe maybe you miss quoting here, <laughs> I have to think about it. Um, I think the research they did was with Rutgers and um, uh, so they, they looked at some of, these, um, some of these generational differences and what's interesting about the research, if you just uh, again go and, and seek it out, is there are generational differences and yet um, all generations have some level of interest you know, around these topics. And so for millennials, they've they've grown up with sort of this idea that every day is Earth Day, right? That that it's just sort of embedded in, in the way you live and, you know, what, you know, how you go about your work and so on. So their expectations are different and what they're looking for from companies is different. But uh, but but I do think, you know, it's, it's I wouldn't discount, you know, your, your baby boomers and your Gen Xers as, 
as folks that don't necessarily have that interest, um, I, think, I think they do, it's just figuring out how do you engage them. So again, that idea of, of the menu, right, and I, I guess the only other comment I would make before we, as it relates to engaging HR partners in this, I mean, Catherine is completely accurate in that, you know, most HR folks uh, have, have many more priorities than they have time to get to. But I think the way, I think one way that you do that is by showing the value add, right? So if, if, it's, if it's possible for them to um, get to a better candidate more quickly, find candidates who are better fits for the organization, drive up uh, employee engagement, so all of those things are, are going to be of interest to HR partners, business partners. So um, I, I think, you know, it, it's probably, again, looking for those points of intersection between the ongoing sustainability goals and priorities, uh, and also, you know, helping them understand that there's a, a great role for them to play and that you want them at the table. Um, I think that's important, too. So with that, um, you know, go ahead and keep moving forward. And with this idea of reimagining HR, it's not that the traditional HR processes won't continue to be important. They will, um, and they're necessary, they're needed. So it's not really an either or, but rather, you know, I think of it, and, and I think Savitz would suggest it's a yes and. So it's, it's more a matter of thinking about what are those traditional ways that companies are going about HR? How can you build on that? And, and really build in some of that sustainability um, componentry. You know, there are so many um, different disciplines within HR. Um, you could probably spend an hour on each of these <laughs> individually. Um, I'll just only spend, you know, maybe about five minutes or so on, on each slide, but, but I did pick four areas that, that I think will be of interest, um, even given some of the comments that have already been made. And those are selection, engagement and retention, development and rewards, and performance management. What I've done with each slide here is, is um, we'll talk a little bit about, so when, when you think about selection, you know, this being sort of the first area, you know, selection is a big area, but um, in, for our purposes today, I've, I've sort of kept my comments to the, the subheader that you see there. So thinking about branding, targeting, recruitment, and hiring. And I'm not, you know, we won't, we won't have time to go through sort of every bullet point here, but I think the important thing as you sort of scan over this is to look for those points of familiarity. I'm guessing that um, for those of you who don't have a, uh, an HR background, you don't, you don't need one to look at this information. You know, everybody can relate to job descriptions, right? Everybody can relate to an employee value proposition, really that with them, what's in it for me from a candidate perspective. Um, you know, the idea of screening and pre-employment testing, right? These are all aspects that are very traditional. If you look at the right-hand side of that, um, you know, of that image there, there is a way, I would argue, and, and Savitt certainly argues in the book, that, um, that, that each of those can be looked through with a sustainability lens. And so we'll just take, you know, we'll just take that first one maybe as an example. So. You know, traditionally, companies look at the employee value proposition, and really, you know, that's a fancy way of saying what draws candidates to an organization, and not only, you know, any candidate, right, but candidates that will be uh, successful and will help the organization be successful. The way that you might use a sustainability lens to look at that, that employee value proposition is thinking through and building in sustainability messaging that showcases the organization's values and commitment and priorities. You know, in some cases, you'll look at, look at what companies are doing with social media, for example, and, and that'll be very apparent. So I've, I've listed for each section that we'll go through today, you know, what I, what I would call a best demonstrated practice. And so we'll sort of move to the bottom here with Campbell. So this is sort of the Campbell soup company that, that many are familiar with, but Campbell has many other brands. Some you might not even realize are owned by Campbell necessarily. Um, but Campbell has done a really um, beautiful job of connecting their CSR messaging into their, their branding and their employee value proposition, um, as has been shared on the call. So they have made a, a, a distinct um, effort to build sustainability into job descriptions for um, existing, you know, roles. 
Um, the other thing I think is really interesting about Campbell, it sort of goes to this new hire process that they, um, you know, a few years back now had, had sort of said, you know, we're going to put a stake in the ground, if you will, we're going to take all of the paper out of our new hire process, which sounds easier, um, <laughs> you know, it's like, like it sounds like an easy thing to do for most large organizations. It's not, right? It's a really difficult thing. Um, but part of the part of the value that they saw in doing that was to make it really apparent from day one to candidates before they're even you know into um, into a hiring process with Campbell that you know this is sort of one way uh, that that we make sure that our HR and hiring processes are aligned with what we're trying to do from a sustainability perspective. Um, down here in the resource section. Dave Stangus, whose name may or may not be familiar to you, he heads up a public affairs and, and corporate responsibility for Campbell. Um, but, I, but I mentioned him as a good person to follow on Twitter. Um, I also think it's interesting, you know, Dave um, either will be at those new hire orientations himself or send somebody from the corporate responsibility team so that each and every employee that comes into Campbell you know, has um, has an idea from day one of what corporate responsibility means at Campbell and why it's important and how they connect to it. So, um, and there's there's more resources here that you can can look at. Um, I, as I shared with Catherine just before we were starting, I tried to include some Twitter resources as well as some websites. And I would encourage you to to you know go go through all of this content as your time allows. And to think about, you know, for your organization and, and where you sit, what are some ways that you could maybe learn from Campbell's example and some things that you could bring in, you know, to your own processes and so on. The next um, aspect here is related to engagement and retention. And we've talked a little bit already on the call about engagement. Uh, this idea of stay, stay, and strive is an idea that Aon Hewitt, who does a lot of employee engagement, surveying for many, many um, companies. This is sort of a model that they use, but, but to me it's sort of an easy and clear way to think about engagement. So engagement um, from an Aon Hewitt perspective really means what do employees say about the organization? How willing are they to stay with an organization? And then the most important aspect is really the strife. How willing are they to give discretionary effort um, to make sure that the organization is successful. Uh, that's sort of the classic definition of engagement. Um, and then, you know, it, again, it, with that stay piece, it sort of ties in the retention piece. So, uh, again, on the left, you see sort of the traditional approach. And if you, if you bring in a sustainability lens, what you see on the right-hand side are additional ways that you might think about uh, engagement and you might think about, you know, that culture piece. So the best demonstrated practice that I've uh, included here is Patagonia. So, you know, many may know Patagonia is a, I mean, they're a, a clothing company, right? They do a lot of outdoor clothing. One of the interesting things that Patagonia does is they have these unpaid leaves, sort of almost like a sabbatical, if you will, up to four months that they give to employees to pursue um, travel, personal interests. I mean, they do a lot with outdoor sports, right? So they could use it to do that. They pay the medical premiums for the time, um, you know, that the individuals are out uh, on these leaves. So it's, so it's a cost, but a, a, a fairly uh, low cost. It's, a, it's an unpaid leave. And the thing that's unique about Patagonia is not that they provide this type of leave, right? Like any, any organization could provide the type of leave, but that they, um, that they sort of use that and promote that as a way for um, people to pursue these interests as well as interests that, that align with their CSR and sustainability efforts. Um, not only do they do that, but they also then have um, individuals sort of bring those stories back you know, to the organization, and then they can sort of build that uh, in as part of the messaging that they're doing to candidates, that they're doing within the organization, that they're putting from a, a PR perspective. And so it's really, a, you know, it, it's not that the practice itself is unique, but how they're utilizing the practice and how they're utilizing that from an engagement piece, that's really the unique. But the resources there at the bottom, if you're interested in learning more about that, 
first is a link to Patagonia's uh, environmentalism you know, website, if you will. The second was a, an interesting article I found that, that features this particular um, program and, and some other programs and then just their Twitter handle there. So I'll take a pause um, now, Catherine, as well, in, in case you want to make any comments or Yeah, I'm not. Um, I'm not sure. I have anything to comment. Uh, I'm seeing a few people in the chat. But I asked um, folks if they are doing a human resource uh, survey right now because you were talking about engagement and sometimes gauging how engaged people are is done through a survey on an annual basis. And I was asking, you know, how many of those surveys actually are integrated with sustainability so that you're um, you're catching some sustainability. Uh, issues or concerns or interests as part of that um, survey. Because I guess one of the questions I would have for you, Susan, is uh, it's long been my belief that, um, it, and, and psychology tells us that meaningfulness in our lives is important to people in general, and that by connecting sustainability with your engagement program brings more meaningfulness to our jobs. Um, and, and I wonder about your experience with that um, around engagement and retention. Yeah, I, I think that's an excellent. Those connections um, for individuals and and allow different ways for people to engage. Um, you know, their level of sort of traditional employee satisfaction as well as engagement is something that that you see. And I mean, there, there's, an, uh, I would say, a growing amount of research that uh, connects that. There's an article in, in the last, one of the last pages of this deck in the resource section, uh, which looked at um, customer service representatives within a financial services setting, and essentially found when you provide an opportunity for individuals to engage in sustainability-related programs, you do see engagement levels go up. And interestingly, and we could almost do a whole session on this topic as well, but, but interestingly, you also see your feelings about senior management improve. And the reason that's really important is whether it's Aon Cubit or other um, survey providers that are out there, you know, people's uh, connectivity, how, how connected they feel to senior management is often something that organizations struggle with. So that's a really important survey, and I've, I've got a link here at the end, but um, great question, so thanks for that. Okay, well, in the interest of time, I'll keep us um, moving along, because I want to at least you know, share this other um, content with you. So the third aspect, and one of the aspects I get the, the most sort of energized around is this idea of development and rewards, and you know how companies are furthering their career development, leadership development efforts, but doing that through a sustainability lens. So the best demonstrated practice that I've highlighted there is IBM. And IBM is a big company. I, I recognize that. I tried to pick some sort of big and size companies to, to feature here. But I think what's What's terrific about IBM is they, you know, for a little while now, have been focused on aligning leadership development to further their sustainability and CSR efforts. So what you see sort of here in quotes is something from well, their IBM Service Core website. I did a link here as well. But the Service Core was uh, developed uh, to do to help IBM do a couple of things. One to build um, build leadership talent, to, to do that in places where IBM is trying to grow their business, three, to do that in a way that, that provides a lot of value to NGOs and other um, individuals and, and communities that wouldn't otherwise have the benefit of the, the professionals that work at IBM. So it is very much sort of a win-win-win Scenario. What you see outlined here is sort of how the service core started. Since 2008, they've built two additional service core programs, one for senior executives and one for high potential talent, so that they're um, making sure that those individuals, you know, are also 
sort of uh, benefiting from these types of experiences. And so just, just to give you an idea of what that tactically looks like, um, you know, in most cases, these are sort of three to six month programs start to finish. There's a lot of sort of prep and, and pre-work, uh, if you will. There's an sort of on the ground uh, type of experience that that, um, in, that an individual in the service corps might have. So it might be a two week experience. It could be like a four week experience, but that's when they're really there and um, doing work and, and sort of being in a new community. And then there's work on the back end to, to sort of tie that back to IBM and, and what IBM is trying to accomplish. I think it's worth noting too, I, I didn't put it in the resources, but if I had to do it over again, I would. Um, there are, you know, a few companies and organizations that help companies like IBM to put these programs together, right? Because as you can imagine from an HR perspective, there's a lot of logistics and, and anything like that. Um, but a, a company that'll be good for you to be aware of is called Pixera Global. It's P-Y-X-E-R-A Global. They're a firm out of DC, but they, they, they basically serve as sort of a matchmaker, right? So they've partnered with IBM and other companies that are interested in these service core types of um, service core types of programs. So uh, again, something really interesting and innovative. And and I would encourage you to think about, you know, for each of your organizations, while the organization may or may not be ready for a service core type of program, you know, what could you do, right? What are what are you doing right now from a leadership development perspective? You know, how might you bake in in one or two of these concepts? you know, as you're planning and, and getting ready for 2015. The other piece on here is related to uh, reward, which I'll just comment on. But, you know, um, aligning performance objectives is very important, and, and I've mentioned that on the next slide, but equally important is making sure that you've got meaningful rewards in place. So you know, to the degree that you can get uh, some of these aspects into job descriptions and performance management, you know, rewards is, is the final extension of that. So with that, that sort of segues nicely into this last slide, which is specific to performance management. And when I think about performance management, it's really two things. You know, one is the goal setting process, and that's um, looking at both your annual goals and your long range goals. And if you were to do that through a sustainability lens, are you doing that in a way that aligns with what the organization is trying to do? And then the second part of that is, is one that we've heard some comments on today, sort of that idea of um, building sustainability goals into one, so that it is either sort of stated or, or understood or there's a discussion around it, right, that it's, it's not one person's job or a team's job but it's really all of our jobs. And the best demonstrated practice that I sort of picked for this one was SC Johnson. So SC Johnson ties appraisals and compensation to sustainability performance for their top 125 managers in the organization. They have a strong sustainability focus. So, um, you know, I think as you look across other roles in the organization, that's not to say that there, that focus is not there in other roles. You know, but they've sort of, again, put a stake in the ground to um, buy some meaningful compensation to that. And the way that they do that is they've actually created what they call their, their green list. And um, so if you look, you know, that link that I've, I've listed in resources will give you more information about that. But essentially, each of the materials and all of their products has a rating um, based on how environmentally friendly it is. And then the ratings are aligned to the organizational goals and product development. And so they've they've actually devised a way here where they can sort of further this goal and tie, you know, the reviews and the compensation to it. So if you want to learn more about that, you know, this link will be helpful. Um, I also found a, a, a Twitter um, handle that they use to, to sort of gather up all of the information out there on green choices. And then they had an interesting um, thing I also saw on their site and through Twitter this 30 green days. So that in your free time, right, <laughs> might be something uh, fun to, to sort of look at. So that's performance management. And in terms of next steps, you know, I would encourage you um, to either make a note now or, you know, in follow-up to our time today, 
you know, identify one or two things where where you work with your local HR team and focus on on and plucking, you know, even if it's one or two of these ideas. The other suggested next step or call to action would be actually get some time on the calendar, right? Schedule a time and, and discuss maybe one of your learnings with your local HR partner. Or again, if you're not in a, a place where you've got an HR team or, or a dedicated partner, pick someone you know that's got that HR background just to even have a dialogue with. Finally, I um, did list a number of resources here that I thought would be helpful. Um, this is the study that I had mentioned a few minutes ago, this was published in the Journal of Marketing earlier this year. Um, absolutely, you know, we're, if you're trying to build a case for engagement, this would be a great place to start. Um, Liz Ma is the Executive Director of Net Impact. She has a, a great article here that I thought would be um, of interest, um, just to sort of do some event, additional benchmarking. Then if you're not up for reading the Journal of Marketing article, uh, this is sort of a really nice summary that was put together and published in HR Executive earlier this year. This would be a great type of link um, to share with an HR partner as an output of today's call, for example. In terms of books, you know, you can clearly tell I've, I've spent a lot of time with the Savitz book. It's a terrific resource. I would absolutely uh, recommend it. It's probably not a book you would necessarily read uh, cover to cover. You could, um, but I think it's a, a great resource for you to have on hand. And then the Elaine Cohen book, CSR for HR, you may or may not be familiar with, but another um, book that's been written about this subject matter. Um, the Aeon Hewitt report that I referenced, there's a link here to that. I actually started a, an open LinkedIn group a few months ago for business leaders and HR leaders interested in learning more about this sort of talent sustainability space, this space that merges the two. So if you'd like to learn more, or just sort of see what individuals in that group have been posting, you know, feel free to um, to go ahead and join that. And then McLean and Company uh, in Canada has done uh, some terrific work. And um, I don't know if anybody from McLean is on the phone with us today, but, but they've actually put together a whole body of research around developing a CSR strategy for HR. And what I've linked to here is an infographic um, or uh, that McLean has put together. So that would be a really nice and share out like to. And then finally, um, I've listed my contact information. So I really hope that um, this information has been helpful, maybe served as a catalyst for you as, as you're thinking about some of these topics. And I'm happy to, to chat with anybody offline who would have an interest in learning more or just having a dialogue. That's okay, terrific. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much, Susan. This has um, been so fantastic. Um, we have uh, about five minutes left, so if you have a question for Susan, um, you can throw it in the chat or um, I'll give you a, in a minute a, a chance to unmute yourself and, um, and to ask a question. Uh, you know, I've heard a lot of good things today, uh, Susan, about, you know, how, you know, kind of almost a checklist of practices that we might use about embedding in goals and job descriptions and having human resources at the table. Um, and a, a number of different areas. One question I do have is, in the human resource profession, what are professionals doing to embed sustainability in their own competency um, frameworks so that they know that sustainability is relevant to what they're doing? Yeah, I think that's a great question. You know, if you look at uh, one of the largest HR associations uh, around the globe is uh, called the Society for Human Resources Management. Um, if you just Google, Google SHRM, you know, you would find that group. And I would say in general, the way that they've embedded that or looked at that from a competency perspective is to sort of put, um, you know, ethics and, and sustainability sort of in one bucket, right, because often HR is called upon to play a role in governance and, and ethics, and, and that's a very natural and, and traditional type of role, um, but that's, that's where they've made that alignment. And so while there is not a sustainability or CSR proper uh, sort of competency area that stands alone, it's often, you know, put with ethics. And, and there is, um, you know, there, there's certainly, you know, an element of focus there, probably not as, as strong as we might see in the future, but um, that's the starting point, I think. Okay. I noticed that Mary was saying that in the Human Resource Professional Association in Canada that um, 
uh, I'm just trying to understand whether it's embedded here as well, Mary. Are you able to, to talk to us about that? Maybe you know the answer to that question. Um, I'm just going to unmute you to see if it's possible for you to talk about that. Mary, I've unmuted you. So are you able to speak at all? Maybe not. I know sometimes people don't have um, the ability to uh, to talk online. Anyway, um, okay, yeah, there's no mic. So, um, uh, so that's really interesting. So you're saying that there has been partially or it's embedded in certain ways. Um, it just seems that, you know, we, we're starting from scratch here, and if it, if it was a push and a pull, you know, the few resource professionals understood that sustainability should be very much part of a lever that they can use to engage and um, improve the performance, that that would be really uh, helpful in the process. Are there any questions for uh, Susan? This is the now the time for you to kind of throw those out there. You can unmute yourself if you like by just clicking on that headphone or phone beside your name and that will open up the mic or you can throw something into the um, uh, into the chat bar and I'll ask um, Susan any questions you might have. And I'm seeing that Esther saying that um, the Quebec Human Resource Association has not embedded it. And, and I guess one of the questions I would have for those of us that do have a connection to the human resource profession, what role do we have in making sure that it does become embedded? You know, how can we um, kind of move that whole thing forward so that uh, this is, there's, a, there's a greater connection there? Any other questions for, for Susan as we, so I've, as I've indicated to people, I will be sending out the presentation and the resources are in the presentation. And um, I don't know if there's anything else anybody wants to ask. Thank you, Mary, that's really good. The national knowledge exam is all multiple choice questions. <laughs> Grr. A case study would be a way to bring in sustainability. I'll bring that idea forward to the Human Resource Association of Alberta. That's brilliant, I love it. Okay. I, it, let me just add, Catherine, you know, if anybody has an interest and or wants to see sort of an example of, of how that HR uh, education component, you know, could work, uh, there was a program that uh, I led the planning on in spring of 2010 that was uh, designed to be presented to an HR community. It was a panel um, discussion, but it was really about, you know, challenges and opportunities for HR and um, sort of linking, linking sustainability. So, um, you know, I, I, I'd be happy to talk about that or, or share that format. It, it was a, a successful program. I think we had about 60 HR professionals uh, who attended and, you know, it was just a great way to um, educate and, and help people make some of those linkages. So I'm happy to share that if, if that's of interest to anyone. Terrific. And I have one last question. I see that Sarah's posted one and then we'll um, stop at that point. Um, so Sarah's asking, um, they always include general employee relations, health and safety, sales, client relationship, and quality KPIs, but I'd like to propose the inclusion of introductory, introductory sustainability KPIs that would be applicable at a high level. Do you have any suggestions on what those could be? Some simple first steps to include sustainability KPIs. Yeah, you know, the way that I've seen that um, work at companies like like Baxter and, and, and other companies where I've sort of, you know, poured through their sustainability reports and so on is, you know, the natural points of connection often for HR uh, are in, you know, areas like health and safety and, and so on like Sarah has, has suggested. You know, the other area where I think most all HR professionals, well, maybe maybe that's too broad of a generali generalization, but many HR professionals connect and see that point of connection is with inclusion and diversity, at least in the United States. So um, I think helping, you know, that can also be an entry point. That's something that is also uh, sometimes a little bit easier to get some, some metrics and, and KPIs built around. Um, but I, I think that's, you know, that, that's something to consider. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to sort of chat offline. Even if you looked at, uh, you know, Baxter uh, organizes into people, planet, and products at a very high level for sustainability goals and priorities. If you went to their website, 
and looked at all the different pieces in the people component. You know, you'd see some of the leadership development we talked about today. You'd see the inclusion and diversity, some of the health and safety components, but that might give you some additional ideas too. Okay. Have you ever seen um, goals around, you know, as an employee, I'm using less paper or are those too simplistic or what, um, you know, I was just thinking of the, 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 there's the social and there's the environmental piece. Um, any, any thoughts around how the environmental piece, what that would look like? Yeah, I, I don't think it's too simplistic. You know, I think organizations should sort of start where they're at and if, if they're sort of at a point where Know, starting with those kinds of metrics and more ones that um, can be easily measured, where, whether that's energy usage or paper usage, amount of recycling. I think those are all great starting points and I think uh, good and in, in at least first steps to, um, to get employees engaged and to increase visibility and to have HR play a role. So I think those can all be good starting points. Great. All right, well, thank you so much for everyone for coming. Thank you, Susan, for bringing all of your great resources and your experience and, and your background to this. And um, uh, it's, it's been a great conversation. And I hope we all go to your LinkedIn site and continue having that conversation because more of us that are talking about this and making these connections, uh, the better. So um, with that, I'm going to uh, stop our recording for today. And uh, thank you everybody for coming and you will receive a copy of the um, presentation and the recording. And uh, hopefully you'll share that with your HR folks. Thanks so much for coming everybody.